Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Alan and Lisa and <clears throat> Brian, who I'm really excited to be reading with and have heard about in Philadelphia for years, but I'm just meeting for the first time. Um, so I, I'll tell you just a little bit about how I came to write the book and then read just a, um, a pretty short 10-minute section from one of the chapters. Um, so I started working on this book about 10 years ago after the Virginia Tech shooting in 2007. Um, there was an interview that was widely aired after that shooting with the gunman's um, creative writing teacher, a woman named Lucinda Roy, and she spoke about how she had seen these signs in his creative writing assignments, these sort of dark, disturbing images and violent content. She had tried to alert the counseling center, the police, the administration, and um, talked about this and even wrote a book about this after the shooting occurred. And I remember at the time I was teaching creative writing and just being really haunted by this interview, haunted by the entire situation, of course, but also really struck by what she was saying about what she had seen in her student writing. I had, um, you know, plenty of times seen things students had written that concerned me in some way. Um, nothing is unambiguously troubling or violent as what she was describing, but um, things that concerned me in all different ways. And sometimes I read things and they felt like occasions where I would definitely intervene and talk to a student. Other times I read fiction and I thought, oh, this feels kind of concerning, but I'm not sure. Um, so I started writing a story about a professor who realizes after a shooting happens that the gunman had been her student and then realizes that he had written something for her class that may have indicated that he was violent. Um, I tried in the novel to keep this kind of in, intentionally ambiguous, whether or not she missed the signs. Um, and it's interesting because I've talked about this book with a lot of teachers, and to a person they all say that she was not negligent. And the paper, portions of the paper are sort of in the book. Um, but I was just thinking about this issue and the sort of responsibility of teachers around it, especially I think writing teachers and the kind of mounting pressure on writing teachers, which is a, like a piece of this larger crisis. Um, so anyway, I wrote a short story about this teacher and then over time the short story I expanded into a novel. I thought that it was basically going to be a novel ab about the teacher. And what ended up happening is it took on multiple points of view. So there's her daughter who's leaving for college herself and has a history with anxiety and sort of eating problems um, and is heading off to college uh, the weekend that the shooting occurs. And then there's other perspectives as well, including another classmate from the class that the shooter was in. Um, so I've, I've done a bunch of readings since this book came out in April, <clears throat> and every single time I've read the same opening <laughs> seven-page scene. But I thought here I would read something different, so you're, this is a test audience. Um, this is a section from the point of view of that student, Luke, the other student who was in the class. Um, so this is set in rural Maine, and um, this is when you're first introduced to Luke and when he's remembering hearing about the shooting and then remembering his, his interactions with the shooter, whose name is Nathan Dugan. <clears throat> What he remembered most about his English class freshman year was Meredith Kenny. She was the kind of student Luke could never hope to be, the kind who always raised her hand in class and seemed to genuinely care and somehow made this seem admirable instead of annoying. Her eyes were different shades of green on different days, like sea glass. Once that semester, she'd read an essay Luke had written about a family trip to Deer Isle when he was little and left comments in the margins in her neat round handwriting. Great job, Luke. Your relationship with your mom is so sweet, smiley face. Can't wait to read what you write next. That Meredith took his dumb paper seriously embarrassed him, but that she took her own so seriously impressed him. Toward the end of the semester, she'd written an essay about her brother, who had been killed somewhere in the Middle East, and read it to the entire class out loud. The room had been silent except for the sound of her voice, which shook and faltered, sometimes dropping to a whisper. At one point, the overhead lights on motion sensors snapped off, and a few people twitched their feet and hands to bring them back. Luke knew the abruptness of losing a person without warning, how they were there, then suddenly just gone, but he couldn't bring himself to write about it, much less read about it out loud. 
as he listened his admiration for Meredith Kenny translated into personal shame. It was this alone that made him try harder on his next paper, an essay about his grandfather, who had died of a heart attack three years earlier. After he read it to the class, he looked up to find Meredith smiling at him sadly. Aw, oh, I'm sorry, Luke. They had never had another class together, and in a school so big, he rarely saw her. Junior year, he heard she had transferred to a college in Massachusetts to be closer to her family. Remembering her brother's death, Luke thought this made sense. Since then, he had Googled her occasionally, but hadn't found her. Facebook turned up dozens of Meredith Kennys, but as far as he could tell, they were all somebody else. When Luke heard the news about Nathan Dugan, it felt like a punch to the throat. It was a Friday in August, still and sweltering, the kind of heat they rarely got in northern Maine. He'd worked the 5 a.m. shift at Dunkin' Donuts and was sitting in his room, too hot to do anything but poke around on his computer, when things started appearing on Facebook and Twitter, links to headlines like shooting at Maine Mall and suspected gunman student at Central Maine State. Luke clicked on one of the links and when he saw the picture froze. That morning, Nathan had walked into the Millview Mall with a duffel bag packed with guns and ammunition and started shooting. The mall was right near campus. Luke had been to it once, spring of senior year, when April Peel dragged him along with her to go shopping for a dress for graduation. Nathan had killed at least three people there, then shot himself. No one knew why. As Luke roamed online, alone in his silent house, his father was at the auto body and his brother still in bed at nearly 1.30. He pored over descriptions of what happened of a YouTube video Nathan had posted that morning and grew nauseated. His mouth filled with spit and he kept swallowing it down. His stomach hurt the way it used to when he was little, pain growing bigger and darker like ink and water until it was so intense he had to run to the bathroom and throw up. Then he brushed his teeth and splashed his face and when he returned to his desk, it was almost unthinkingly that he began to type. He wasn't too active on social media though he constantly checked his accounts. Now and then he would post one of his drawings on Facebook or Instagram and tag it hashtag nature or hashtag art or hashtag just screwing around and it would get four or five comments and likes aunt millie his mother's only sister who liked everything matt his best friend from growing up who now had an apartment with his college roommates down in portland occasionally luke heard from one of his fellow es majors but he never got more than a few responses and that was fine he didn't expect anything more that he thought was the internet in general a lonely landscape a largely barren place, but with these rare bursts of not loneliness, these moments of connection that made it worthwhile sometimes. That afternoon, he started writing, not really thinking, just wanting to connect to anyone else who had known Nathan and might understand how he felt. As he typed, random memories kept popping in his head. The boxy headphones Nathan used to leave hanging around his neck, the way he sat, index fingers pressed together on his desk, the dog he sometimes brought to class, that creepy paper he wrote, the big green coat, the stress ball he would squeeze until his knuckles went white. He tagged it, Nathan Dugan and Millville Mall shooting and freshman year and wrote, if anybody else from class is reading this, please write back. After he posted it, he sat in silence. He was vibrating. He almost never talked about personal things online or in general. April used to urge him to talk about his feelings, something he didn't miss about her and his first instinct was to just delete it. What if someone was offended he was posting about Nathan or thought he was remembering him wrong? But it wasn't like anyone would really read it. Maybe with luck he'd reach a few old classmates. He realized he was mostly hoping to hear from Meredith Kenny, hoping his post would find its way to her through the online alumni chain. He changed his privacy settings to public just in case. Instead of Meredith, though, within minutes other comments began appearing. Matt and Aunt Millie, but random people too. Marissa Calabasas from high school who now lived in Boston. Oh my God, must be so upsetting at someone you actually knew, Luke. Someone named Liz, a friend of Marissa's. Sounds like he was a budding psychopath even then. Heather Doyle, who he'd worked with at Dunkin' Donuts that morning. Horrified, emoji face. <laughs> Within 15 minutes, his post had 17 likes, eight comments, and six shares. For a while, he just sat there, hitting refresh every few minutes and watching the numbers tick upward. 25 likes, 13 comments, 12 shares, 52, 28, 25. 
The attention was nerve-wracking, but kind of exhilarating. Around 5.30, he left his room, retrieved the dogs from the backyard, and topped off their water bowls. Then he made himself a ham sandwich, ate half of it, and gave the dogs the rest and returned to his desk. 98 shares, 111, 131, 153. At 6.30, when his father's truck came rumbling down the driveway, Luke went downstairs. His brother Brent was there, too, kind of hovering near the couch. When their dad walked in, he dumped his stuff on the kitchen counter and came into the living room and looked surprised to see them there. For a long moment, he looked at them, and Luke just watched him, wondering what he'd say about the shooting. He remembered the way he'd gazed at his father the day of his mother's accident, and over and over in the weeks and months after, just waiting for him to say something that would help. He felt that way now, like he was ten, waiting, but what his, what his father said was, you two are on your own for dinner. Then he walked to the porch and Luke heard the wheezy couch springs as his father sat down, the twin thumps of his work boots hitting the floor. Luke looked at his brother, and for a minute their eyes locked. His brother already had his car keys in his fist. He was probably going to meet up with his dumb friends, Mike and Leighton, and although us usually Luke hoped they hung out somewhere else, tonight he wished for a minute that Brent would stay. Then his brother breathed, have fun, and headed for the door and was gone. Luke listened as his father turned on the TV, the muffled sound of the news through the living room wall. His brother's truck went tearing down the driveway, timing belts squealing. A woman on TV was saying, all of a sudden I heard the sound like balloons popping. Luke went back to his room and closed his door and sifted through the new comments. Hang in there, Luke, smiley face. You're expressing exactly how I feel about people like this. How do you know when to do something? Who's dangerous and who isn't? And just glad you're safe. As the night grew darker, the comments appeared more quickly, and more of them were from strangers. Luke pictured people in rooms all over the state of Maine reading what he'd written on their computers and their phones. It was kind of thrilling to be this point of connection, but sometimes unsettling. Stop giving this fucking loser the fame he was looking for. Somebody should have paid attention to him sooner. A few people had posted links to Nathan's YouTube video, which gave Luke a twang of panic, but to his relief, it was gone when he clicked. This video has been removed. Soon, he reminded himself, the numbers would stop climbing, the focus shift to something else, but for now, they just kept growing. 212 shares, 259, 326. There was another reason one he didn't admit on Facebook, why four years later Nathan Dugan was so stuck in Luke's brain. It was a thing that happened in English class that year, just after spring break. He remembered the timing of it because he'd been unhappy to be back at school again. He didn't much like his roommate, a hockey player, and hadn't made any real friends yet. And it had been nice, or if not nice, at least relatively easy to spend the last two weeks back home. By senior year, he would have found his niche, a major in environmental studies, a brief, not too serious relationship with April, who subsequently and kindly broke up with him because he was going home to New Jersey. She was going home to New Jersey, but not before he spent senior week basically living in her apartment and feeling okay, even almost confident about his standing in the world. But on that day in late March, as he gathered his stuff at the end of class, he had felt his usual unease. The sensation was a contradiction. The feeling that he was both completely invisible and acutely, terribly seen. He grew overly conscious of the space his body occupied, of how his face looked and what his arms were doing, how he stuffed one hand in his pocket in a way that was meant to look casual but felt obvious and strange. The pocket too small or his hand too big. As he walked toward the door, backpack on shoulder and hand in pocket, Nathan Dugan had been standing there, his dog beside him, a friendly lad with a chewed-up ear that Luke often had the urge to pet, but never did. Hey, Nathan Dugan said, too loudly, as Luke approached. He realized that Nathan had been waiting for him. He glanced around, uncomfortably aware of the other kids leaving the room. He drew his hand out of his pocket. Hey, he replied. Nathan was wearing his winter coat, even though the weather was spring-like. His headphones were dangling around his neck, arms stiff at his sides. He was a pretty unusual kid, although Luke didn't mind him as much as his classmates, who exchanged loaded looks any time he spoke. He had a habit of interrupting people, what Luke's mother might have called unable to read the room. When Luke was little, babbling to her about his ant farm or his bike tricks while she was trying to pay bills, she'd said this about him sometimes, too. Now, though, Nathan was focused on him, and in his abrupt way, he said, we should hunt sometime. 
Luke saw a few other kids look over and hoped they hadn't heard him. He had no clue why Nathan would single him out for this dubious honor. Because he wrote that essay that mentioned trout fishing with his grandfather. Because he and Nathan both lived in Maine, but lots of kids did. Maybe it was just that Luke seemed like someone who wouldn't say no. In fact, Luke did consider it for a second. He didn't have many friends, and though he didn't want to be friends with Nathan, he felt kind of bad for him. He missed his dogs and wouldn't have minded hanging out with this one. But as Luke stood there, his sympathy quickly soured. The expression on Nathan's face, it bugged him. The way he was just looking at him, waiting for an answer. His skin looked kind of sticky, kind of desperate. Loneliness rose off of him like bad breath. Luke had the feeling that if he said yes, he might never shake him, and he didn't want to be associated with him, didn't want to catch it. And suddenly, there was Meredith Kenny, smiling at Luke as she squeezed out the door behind Nathan's back. Luke returned the smile, and she widened her eyes and grimaced. Yikes, she meant. Yeah, I don't think so, Luke said. It came out meaner than he'd intended. Luke watched as Meredith was swallowed by the crowd in the hallway, and when he looked back at Nathan, his face had closed over not even angry or hurt, just gone. Nathan put his headphones on and shuffled his big hood up and walked away without another word. Luke stood there for a minute, pretending to fish for something in his pockets to put a little distance between them. He felt mostly relieved, but also guilty. He hadn't meant to be a jerk to Nathan. He understood it had been a big deal for him to ask. A few weeks later, when he'd been stuck in a group with Nathan and read his creepy essay about hunting with his father, Luke's relief came back. He let himself off the hook for being rude, even complimented himself on his instincts. Now, though, hearing about the shooting, it was the guilt that returned. He kept thinking about Nathan's expression in class that day. It was needy, insecure. It wasn't the face of a killer. Somehow, though, four years later, he was so angry or lonely or just messed up that he was bragging about shooting people on YouTube, that getting fired from his stupid part-time job had pushed him over the edge. Luke couldn't shake the feeling that it didn't have to happen, not that he really thought he could have changed anything. He knew that. But he wondered if in some small way his rejection had affected Nathan, made something tighten at his core. One more tiny moment added to an accumulation of tiny moments, like the volcano he'd made in seventh grade science, how each ounce of vinegar you dripped through the hole in the top brought the whole thing a notch closer to blowing up. Thanks. Hi. Um, th thank you, Elise. That was uh, riveting. I, I totally want to read it. <laughs> so reserve one of those copies for me. Um, I'm Lisa Sewell, and I teach courses in poetry, um, poetry writing, study of poetry in the English department. And it's great to see everybody here today. Um, so I think this reading is going to be, you know, we, not on the same theme, I don't think. Um, I'm, I'm teaching. Um, a course in environmental poetry and ecological criticism, um, and we're reading Brian Tier's work in that class. Um, his third book, Companion Grasses, and his new chapbook, um, which I don't think the bookstore was able to get copies of, but is very lovely, um, are the first works um, of the 21st century eco poetry that we've encountered so far in my class. And I'm really happy that I organized the class so that Brian's work is our starting point. Because with poems like Quaking Grass, Atlas Peak, Transcendental Grammar Crown, and To Begin With Desire, which are all from his third book, Companion Grasses, has offered me and my students an education in best practices for creating an ethical eco-poetics, a kind of map or field guide for how to write about the non-human world without anthropomorphizing and repeating the mistakes of romanticism, particularly in the context of global climate change and our current unecological moment of emergency. In a review of Companion Grasses, Jacqueline Lyons writes that Brian is the kind of poet Thoreau daydreamed about one who can transplant words to the page, and this is Thoreau, with earth adhering to their roots. I love that, and it seems exactly right to me. In his poems, language is both expressive 
and material hovering between, and now I'm quoting from one of Brian's poems, kinesis and mimesis, process and scene, body and world. Via Thoreau, Lyons also suggests that he is a poet who can, quote, impress the winds and streams into his service to speak for him. But I'm not sure um, I agree. Impress into service doesn't seem right to me. The poems speak for him. His careful renderings of the birds, grasses, scat, and sandbags that occupy the landscapes he travels through and of their complex interdependencies with each other, with his speaker, provide the reader with a sense of their kinetic physical presence. He does allow others to speak through him, opening up his poems to the words of transcendentalists like Thoreau, Emerson, and Dickinson, philosophers like Heidegger and Erigere, the 20th century poet Robert Duncan, the composer Charles Ives. Brian is the author of five critically acclaimed books, most recently Companion Grasses, which was a finalist for the Kingsley Tufts Award, and The Empty Form Goes All the Way to Heaven. Both of those books are available um, at the back of the room. He has received numerous honors, including a Lambda Literary Award and fellowships from the NEA, the Pew Foundation, the American Antiquarian Society, and the McDowell Colony. He lives, he's also local. We have local writers try to come in the fall. Um, and uh, in, he lives in South Philadelphia and he teaches at Temple University. He also makes beautiful books by hand for his Micropress Albion books. I hope you'll join me in welcoming him to Villanova. Thank you so much. That was such a generous intro. And um, I was raised Catholic, so praise is always deeply embarrassing. <laughs> I'm always like, no, no, that's wrong. That, but um, you learn to live with it over time, um, though not without blushing. I will begin uh, with, a with a request um, with the final poem in the book, Companion Grasses. Um, and I won't speak too much about it, uh, because the poem, I think, is pretty, uh, for me especially, self-explanatory. Um, but one thing, one reason I named, like, Companion Grasses is actually a biological relationship between um, plantings. And um, one thing I was really interested in was the fact that um, several of the, three of the poems in this book, which are named for grasses, um, every time I had a relationship with a grass, it got triangulated with a person that was kind of associated with that grass in some way. And so that I started to think a lot about how, about companionship um, with species, but also the way that species and people have these kind of interrelationships. And so this poem is called, is called Star Thistle. Um, it is an elegy for the poet Reginald Shepard, who died in 2008. Um, no, 2000, no, that's correct. Um, 10 years ago, um, this month. And um, the poem mentions two things. One is um, the field I love um, and the place Atlas Peak. Um, Atlas Peak is a mountain. Um, not a very big one, but a mountain above Napa Valley. Um, one of the ironies about reading this poem now is that the field I love has burned. Mm -hmm. um, the Atlas Peak Fire, which actually in an interesting way living in California, you begin to understand um, that landscape is designed to burn. It's our landscapes, our made landscapes that are not. Um, so it's not unusual, actually, for California to go up in fire. And for a lot of those species, they're actually what's called fire adapted. Um, and so uh, the field I love, however, is not fire adapted. And this poem's actually about um, other, th other things. But so when I mentioned the field I love, it was a field on Atlas Peak that um, a friend of mine had a cabin near that I would sometimes stay in. So this is Star Thistle. 
He died and lamplight that night brought out against fog its grid of gambits. Each street a perfect winter dissembled. Pure effect after that, anything outside all scumble. Marine layer a low hover that suffered dwelling to disappear into weather, facade, a slow fade into gradient. His death felt like that to unlock and open the front door onto a lost element, looking for purchase, to find a vanishing inside, a home where once there'd been rooms and no humus into which to inter his memory, no image. From 50 miles away, a thousand feet below the field I love, I tried to remember how spring undoes the year like a knot. How winter's hay, how winter hay's flat, thin cover turns gold, gray beneath rain, keeps close to ground the germinal heat. How grasses thread up through the remainder of what sowed them and help break it down. All spring, following his death, I turned in thought to pale green, stems infiltrating the annual weave of leavings, each seed a knot in the energy net flung out over the field so the caught space can blossom. June 4th, I board the ferry in time to see spring end on Atlas Peak, grasses turning again to seed. And one thing I have to explain is in California, the seasons do the opposite that summer, everything is dead. I mean, not trees, but you know, the grasses are dead, unlike here, um, where spring is the, you know, things come alive and then summer is very, very verdant. Um, so June 4th, I board the ferry in time to see spring end on Atlas Peak, grasses turning again to seed. Each stem an eidolon of itself, brittle inflorescences shattering in my wake. I leave the cabin each afternoon for the field's edge to sit and watch what I can't see work the surface. Wind, which I've never cared for in particular, cares only for particulars. This rachis, this spikelet, these laudicules, nothing too miniature to be seized by a shaking, neither grief nor fear, and far more complete. Days I close my eyes, I hear the smallest ocean's smallest surf break beneath my feet, a pile of gold seeds that rattles the dust. After 14 years of living with HIV and the side effects of protease inhibitors, after persistent misdiagnosed abdominal pain turned out to be colon cancer that spread to his liver, after the removal of the tumor and the majority of his colon, after chemotherapy is nausea and neuropathy, after a perforated abdomen led to a heart attack following three surgeries and a seizure after the second surgery, after severe peritonitis, and a very bad case of blood poisoning that almost killed him. Reginald died. His final letter to me ending as always, take good care, my friend. A gesture, I leave the field to hike up the trail, thick with wildflowers, less vetch this year, but plenty of mariposa lilies, all the flowers bountiful until halfway to the ridge. I enter another field of a liminal tint, blue-green, stems covered in pale hair, thousands still tender, but others older, each branch ending in a bright ball of spikes soon to bloom. Yellow star thistle, non-native invasive, in quotation marks, particularly noxious to grazing animals. Each year the thistle spreads farther down trail. Each year each plant bears one to a thousand seed heads, each seed head holding as many as 80 seeds, the life of one plant, easily leaving 100 behind. Knowing nothing I do will help. I pull up a hundred young plants each time I pass the first field of them. I grip each stem low to ensure I get the long ingenious taproot that even during drought reaches water and my forearms blister where they're pricked by lateral spines. It might be bad morning to want the thistle gone, but I go on hating it. 
It seems an uncanny design ensures its slow destruction of an ecosystem. It chokes out healthy grassland flora, even kills grazing animals that might control its spread. Uncanny, it survives drought and thrives off wildfire, both. Just a pretty plant, holistic in its grip of a habitat. The thistle is not metaphor and extends into the future as far as I can see, easily filling the field I love. At its edge, I stand, my skin a stipple of blisters. Something startles me where I thought I was safest, Whitman says. Now I am terrified at the earth. It is that calm and patient as it undoes itself, undoing that toughens to give way relentlessly to nothing but its own propagation. The earth undoes itself as each life undoes itself, and to what end is what terrifies me, as after the hike I try with salve to soothe the blisters that deepen and weep weird clear fluid. The day before Reginald died, we spoke on the phone, but morphine filled his speech so completely it was terrible to listen to him, disappearing even as he said, I love you, and I echoed him, the last thing I could bear before I had to say goodbye, filled with the certainty I'd failed to witness the death of a friend I'd loved. Good morning accepts transience, sure, it makes sense in the field I love, where I see next year already on the stem. Sun draws in fluorescences taut, and wind separates what's left into seed and chaff. But I was raised to believe in a personal God attending a death whose final horizon is eternity, an ideal persistent as the star thistle seed carried to California by contaminated feeds in the 1850s, whose progeny covers 12 to 15 million acres currently. What chemistry, as Whitman would say, it is that calm and patient. And though the thistle isn't metaphor, I find myself kneeling, weeding the lowest field again, and I become everything about root giving up ground, the groan it grudges as it eases up out, the subtle scent of the flower that when eaten by horses causes brain lesions and mycosal mouth ulcers that lead to eventual death by starvation and dehydration, and when eaten by bees makes exceptional honey heavily fragrant and strangely dark, almost gray. Two weeks before we spoke, Reginald in the hospital wrote his last poem, God with us, ending it, how I want to believe, a pearl, an irritant. It's one thing to want to believe, to live by building a mind on the fault between faith and doubt, it's another to believe the longing for belief and attack, a distrust of immersion in the material given us as habit and habitat. No possible rush of friendship for stones, grasses, and humus, as if the human were over and the wild deer in us were released at last, at dusk, to disappear into the stand of Manzanita far across the field I love. If we die to become nothing but matter so that being itself might continue, grounded by ground itself, such a sweet thing out of such corruptions, who wouldn't wish to linger in the material world that won't spare me or let me hold a living hand to him? All spring, I'll return to bring grief to the field, always, one root I can't pull out entire. As above, so below. From star down to thistle, it's all the same. Still firm in the ground, today it breaks in my hand. Bad morning that this summer flowers, the life only destruction makes possible. You requested it.
I find even 10 years from, from then, it's still hard to read that. And as you heard in that poem, um, and as uh, Lisa uh, kind of in, implied in her introduction, one of the things that that book really wrestles with is a metaphysical tradition um, that's all bound up in the United States um, with environmentalism, that I think environmentalism can't be discussed critically without wrestling with the legacy the, and the metaphysics of transcendentalism. Um, which I always say to my students is a Christian philosophy or metaphysics. It may have, like Flannery O'Connor, if you've ever read Wise Blood, like the Church of Christ Without Christ, that's transcendentalism, is the Church of Christ Without Christ. Emerson gets rid of Christ in his um, Harvard Divinity School speech um, so that we can have a more direct connection to the divine. But if you get rid of materiality, you get rid of the suffering of matter, right? Like, which is what Christ is in part. Um, and so I was really interested as a queer person, um, as someone who, you know, lost a partner to AIDS, I was really interested in a metaphysics, and some of my earlier work really thinks about what is the metaphysics of the AIDS epidemic. Um, what is the metaphysics of a materiality that isn't Christian? Um, and that's kind of a question behind my work. Of what is the metaphysics of a of material life that isn't a Christian one? Um, so I'm going to read a couple of newer pieces that um, uh, like between this book and what I've, the book that's coming out in the spring is The Empty Form Goes All the Way to Heaven, which is about a long period of chronic illness. Um, and so that was a period that also kind of made me think a lot about materiality and suffering and metaphysics. So this is a poem called Sitting River Meditation, set in Vermont. And I had not written for a long time when I wrote this poem. So this was also my way of writing myself back into my body and also into the world. Um, yeah. At night, the river frozen over fits its bed like a key, its lock. The current keeps turning, but the surface won't open. I can hear ice click shift, its crystalline pins caught. 20 miles south of Lake, Lake Eden, its origin, the Gihon's near its end. The Gihon is this river. After the old red mill, before it enters the Lamoille, it falls flat, a closed door. Wrong key in the wrong lock. I like to put my mind where two worlds meet and agree to disagree. The teachers say, take up the water, Make it your body and mind. Make it thought. But I think I must think the way elements make temporary arrangements with weather. Hydrogen locked to oxygen. <coughs> Each strong molecule expands a lattice of tetrahedrons. All their new shapes make ephemeral color. The way what light there is at midnight heightens ice, brighter briefly than snow. And toward that whiteness, my mind pushes outward from the interior where olivine water washes over gravel and sand. Thought exerts drag against the icy underside, and I feel a border. Experience can't cross over into knowledge. The way in front of paradox, my mind stops. For five years, my ill body killed me while it kept me alive. On the bank, bare brambles catch snow, weighted with rain that falls straight down, hissing as it hits the ice. Who am I now? Above mountains, below the river, both moving and still, inaccessible and everywhere, being is and keeps to itself hidden in emblems of the outward, seeds extracted from bracts of a dry pine cone. The spring equinox is near, 
Rain coaxes the icy lattices to relax into laps, little cracks mid-river. It's so quiet, I hardly feel desire. But its soft force flenses the strongest water from thaw. There, at the thinnest brink, kinesis that resists stillness, thinking on thinking, the current pulses. And then I'll end with one last poem. Um, called Atlas Peak. And this is from Companion Grasses. Oh, and I'll just say, for those of you who haven't read the book or, or seen it, um, it is, this is, it's a short poem. I'm gonna describe it as though like, it's some epic thing. It, um, but I was really interested in the haiban form, um, the Japanese travel diary form that Basho, um, is kind of a prime example of, and um, his book, The Narrow Road to the Interior, which, that's one translation of that title, there's many. Um, it's like a beautiful and sort of classic kind of example of that form. And, but they're Americans, when they do hyphen, because Americans like to do everything, um, they often do spin variations on that form. And so I, being a like shitty imperialist American took that form um, and made my own version of it. Um, and so um, what I was interested in was the relationship in, in Haiban, it's prose and then a haiku and prose haiku. And the haiku are like stops in the action. Um, and they're often, and sometimes I can't tell if it's my, non-Buddhist mind, my Western education, or the translations that I'm reading, sometimes the haiku, you're like, what is the relation of that to the action? I'm just not totally clear. Um, and so I think it's all of the above, <laughs> like my Westernness, my non-Buddhistness, and the translations that all get in the way. But I was really interested in sort of like taking that dyad of lyric and prose action and sort of keeping each page a kind of lyric and then a prose action, but flipping them back and forth um, in this chain across the pages. So you'll hear what you'll hear. I will try to vocalize the kind of spatiality of the lyrics and then the fastness and sort of run on nature of the action. The poem won't take that long to read. Um, Again, it sounds epic. I just wanted to explain, because this is an educational institution, that, like, <laughs> but that there was like some intellection behind these choices, because um, it's really just a love poem, um, ultimately. But both to a place and to a specific person. Atlas Peak. Dirt path, berry black scat, grass nest. The old corrals, white paint whiter for summer's colors ending in the fields, weathered silver stalks. Inside the red gate we paused, rust on our fingers. A chain held the path behind us shut, up past the abandoned corral through bracken, after a felled tree forked the way, rightwards up and even steeper lay the ridge. But we paused under a bare oak where trucks had once stuck, leaves glutted their ruts. We pa paused, day empty of horses. We absent the sweetness of hay. Rocky and even and closed by chaparral, then opening onto pasture, our sight line belonged solely to path. Deer track lent color, umber and ochre, rock, light struck, chips of scintilla, bark, lichens, mimic, signature. It was like having to choose matter or the look of matter and getting lost in the distance before the choice. We walked there, seeing the way scat contains hungers, evidence and residue, seed, fiber, fur, bone. Thus concentrated, vision became more. From the path, its fence seemed to enclose nothing of its own. <laughs>
But over at Horizon, we felt, held an inverted bowl. Eastward, the peak rose over the plateau. To the west, the ridge crested and fell to the valley's trough. Left then unto meadow, unto countless contradictory crisscrossed winnowed ways across its acreage, left unto burrs and thistles slivering our shins, unto branch slap, unto scratch and sting and welt, left unto, until upward dead end and backtrack led us to where the trees tilt split the earth we'd wanted to stand at edge of, to where wander showed us sundown held in its crown, horizon its root in air. We paused again outside the gate. More than home, I desired the sleep-colored grasses, burnishing, turning silvers. I wanted to keep inside the shut eye the look of them, inflorescence spent and toppled bent stalk, wind handling their panicles, a dream arranged down to its smallest logic. This way dark and that way shine until there's only one way back. You called my name, and the moment stayed, the only scent, my face in your neck. So the corral enclosed something, if only it was our wish for it, as our wish for the grasses, flattened, fanned out, a pearlescent gray, where lately had slept, what was also its shape. Thank you. Yeah, so um, Brian and Elise have agreed to answer questions, and I guess they'll, should they move this? They'll sit together up here. We were all light. We were so light. Thank you. Especially for the inside. So, when you wrote your perspective on a college and a high school student, I was wondering, in terms of character, how do you kind of separate yourself from that character in order to give it the proper perspective? Yeah, that's a really good question and probably applies to all characters. Just how do you separate yourself from that person and try to sort of get inside them? Um, it was a particular challenge with this with this book. Actually, I find like the things I wrote um, when I was first finishing stories felt kind of closer to my own life, and the more I write, the, the farther away I go, and that feels interesting to just get inside people who feel more and more different from me. Um, sometimes people who do things I don't really understand. So um, there's a few characters in the book who are the college age. There's, there's Luke, who's just graduated from college, and then there's Anna, who's the teacher's daughter, who's just leaving for college. Um, actually, uh, several of their chapters I kind of workshopped with my own students um, at the end of the semester, <laughs> having workshopped lots of their work. I said, how would you like to give me feedback on mine? So, and they were really interesting discussions, um, just to hear the things that resonated with them, the things that didn't feel quite right to them. There's a lot of social media stuff in the book, and I, um, like the teacher in the book, I'm not much of a social media person, so I was polling my students to see if it seemed accurate. And the, the one, the note they gave me was it wasn't mean enough. They said, be meaner. <laughs> um, but, um, the character in the book that was the hardest to kind of leap into what you're asking about, when I finished the book, I met with my editor, and the one big note that she had was that she thought that I needed to include a chapter from the perspective of the shooter's mother. 
And when she told me that, I just, it was like my heart sank. That was just a place I did not want to go. And the whole book was a hard one to write, but I thought the shooter's mother, that's just not a place I want to dwell, you know? Um, so it was like thinking through lots of things. I mean, just who she was and how she would think about him, which is different from how everyone else thinks about him. And then also how things just like the tone and sentence length and those kinds of things like support her, the feeling of her and the voice of her. Um, it's like a roundabout way of answering your question. But I think for all of them, there was a certain amount of like leaping inside someone else. So um, trying to think through everything from just how the experience would feel to them from that vantage, just soliciting kind of feedback from readers to thinking about how the writing itself is supporting their point of view. That's a great question. And I also actually feel like it applies to fiction <laughs> um, in terms of balancing kind of research and, and embodied knowledge, you know, like embodied states. So my process tries to account for those things. So as you might kind of could tell from a poem like uh, Star Thistle, like I hiked that a lot. Like, so my sense of the physical relation to that place and also that particular species, which I had such, when I, <laughs> as I learned what it was and how the, uh, there's like a lot of narrative that isn't there in terms of like how people in California actually deal with that species. Um, like, because when it's really young, animals can eat it. Like, so you can hire sheep or goats to like come and eat the star thistle when it's like a baby but then if it gets just a little too old it's full of those toxins that cause the mouth ulcers and brain lesions um and if i were re writing that poem now like i've done so much research into botanicals and then also to like the idea that like plants communicate and the ways plants communicate and like plants defend themselves like that like now I would be thinking more from the star thistles perspective <laughs> and be like you're just really good at defending yourself like good for you you know like um but I think then I you know for various reasons for grief for like my love for that landscape which was being really transformed and the fact is that that plant does crowd out pretty much everything else like when it takes over a field like nothing else can grow and nothing else will grow unless you really take take that landscape back so anyways there's a lot of lived actual like the way I write a lot of my poems is by hiking the same routes and taking notes while I hike so that I create a sort of st structure to the poem um, a kind of what I think of often as a trellis um, that the language kind of like grows on and then each um, cons consecutive draft like I add the research in and as you might expect like research can be hard to make musical and I am someone who's a little bossy with my music um, mm -hmm. and that I have a really particular ear that I you know whatever I could go into a whole thing about prosody and Gerard Manley Hopkins and Inscape and blah 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 all that stuff which I will not do but I have reasons for that I feel like my body is there in the music and the felt relation with a place is in the music um, and it comes out rhythmically like and that to me is like a sort of signature of the corporeal intercorporeal relation with a place um, that certain kinds of music get made in certain places like that poem to me was really hard because the lines are very long and they're kind of prosy. Um, and most, as you heard with sitting river meditation, like I tend toward a tighter um, sound. Um, and so it was hard to like sort of layer in the, the research of, you know, the backstory, all this, the kind of, um, yeah, it's hard to make that musical. But so I, the way that I try to get it to work is by scaffolding it inside of it, of, 
either the actual structure of a hike, like in the new book, almost all of them are the actual like route. Um, but then along the route, the encounters with different species like sort of elicit different like little moments of research. Um, so I try to make it sort of feel, quote, natu natural is the <laughs> problematic word, <laughs> but to, for it to feel organically arising from the thing. And that, again, was harder. The structure of Star Thistle is emotional and figurative. So like when to bring in that researchy stuff, was that timing was trickier. Um, and then the music of that poem shifts several times um, from a more heightened um, alliterative music to a slightly prosier narrative one. So I, I, it was hard, that one was hard-ish to do. Um, but other poems like that Atlas Peak poem, that's literally lyrics of standing in this one field, like observing in this kind of like 360 kind of thing. And then literal narratives of like one hike. So for me, that was just writing while hiking and write like that one day and sort of trying to capture um, the spatiality of that. But yeah, I find it, I, it's a drafting process of layering in the info and sort of like splicing my note, my sort of hike notebook with like the other kind of research. Um, and often I'll make, like in the new book, almost all the work is syllabic. So I'll make sort of like musical rules to kind of like hijack the research into the hike so that they have the same sound, which I obviously didn't, I haven't always done that. Sometimes I really let the two registers bash against each other. That's a long rambly answer. Did that help? Okay. Yeah, it was, um, so the situation in the book is fiction, um, so it's not literally based on what happened to Virginia Tech, but it was definitely inspired by listening to that teacher talking and just thinking about that particular issue. Um, I've mostly heard from teachers. Um, my book came out shortly after the Parkland shooting. And um, I heard from um, a couple of teachers in Florida who had taught that student a few years ago and were so shocked because they hadn't seen any signs. Um, and were so mystified thinking back about, thinking about him and, and wondering what they missed, you know. Um, so I've, I've mostly heard from, from teachers who, not just writing teachers, but all kinds of teachers who seem to be, um, especially now, I think more and more aware of and feeling the pressure of this situation, you know, not missing students who are coming through with issues that they need to be paying attention to and having a hard time figuring out what those look like, you know, not being trained psychologists, you know. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a lot of the feedback that I've been getting and the people I've been hearing. Yeah, I, I have that. So I was the kind, of, I dropped out of high school and took a really windy route through my undergraduate. And so, and I wasn't a particularly good student for a really long time. And, um, but I did like poetry. And I came to poetry through, t like I was the worst kind of student in that I took it during the summer. And I was like, it's gonna be so easy. And it'll be like the kind of student that I'm always like, oh, why are you in my class? <laughs> Although I was you, so who am I to, you know, like whatever. Um, but that's why I can spot him a mile away. Um, but so, 
I we are reading all this very particular kind of 20th century poetry. And I didn't really have any strong preferences coming in. I had a really shitty education. I dropped out of high school. I'm from Alabama. I mean, we have one of the worst educational systems in the country. Um, so I was like, whatever. And I kind of was maybe like, yeah, Emily Dickinson's OK, I guess. You know, um, That was maybe my awareness at that moment. And then I had to take, because you, one does, like a survey course about which I remember nothing except for the moment I read Gerard Manley Hopkins. And what I love about it is I was such a bad student, I hadn't even read it before class, because that was the kind of student I was. So I read it in class, and it's, I remember this, I will remember this till the day I die. It was like I had a seizure. Like, I had never heard anything on the page that sounded like what I heard in my head, and when I heard it, it was like having like the echo of a bell tower inside. Like it was like being inside the bell when the bell's ringing, if that makes any sense. I just was like, holy shit. Um, and but as you can imagine, like I then started when I was taking poetry, writing like terrible Gerard Manley Hopkins imitations, <laughs> and being told like you can't. This is such a really particular kind of sound. Everyone knows that you're faking. You're a fake <laughs> Gerard Manley Hopkins, and you cannot do this. So I trained myself to write a much plainer kind of poem, more plain spoken. Um, and then over the years, there were other poets. There's a, a poet that most people don't know anymore named Linda Hull, um, who was an incredible writer, um, and also came from different circumstances than I, but also was really interested, as I was in my early work, in a relationship between, like, um, you know, autobiographical experience that many people would, would think of as um, extreme, and a kind of extreme gildedness of the language. Does that make sense? And I loved that about her work. And she loved Hart Crane, and I loved Hart Crane, of course, because that would be the other person that everyone was like, you're just imitating Hart Crane. Um, and I was like, you're just saying that because I'm gay. Um, that was the kind of student I was. Like, I'm, like, I'm invalidating your criticism because you're homophobic, which is not true. But, um, but it took me a really long time. Basically, all of my teachers would just say, you have to find your line, Brian. Like, find your line. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> like, where is it? Can I go to the line store? Like, what is that? What are you even saying to me? And no one really talked to me. Like, even though I had learned the technicalities of meter and I'd learned all those things, like, no one ever really was like writing free verse and like prosody. Let's think about how they're related and like all, you know, et cetera. So eventually, over time, I kind of learned. I learned about Williams, I learned about variable feet, I learned about the ways that you could organize stresses in a line, the relationship between stress and unstressed in a free verse line. This is all, for those of you who aren't poets, I apologize for speaking gibberish. Um, and then I came actually back to Hopkins through, this is gonna sound really weird, through the notion of projective verse, through Charles Olson's projective page but I kept thinking, because Gerard and Manley Hopkins wrote before the typewriter, I kept thinking, like, Hopkins would have loved the typewriter, because he could score his speech visually. And he would have loved that, um, because that is what he was trying to do, is score his internal world through the language that he knew, i.e. traditional prosody in English. Um, and stretching it as far as you can without it really going haywire. But I, I sort, so for me, there's a relationship between the score, like Olson's idea of the line as a measure of breath and the syllable as a place of the ear speaking um, and the scoring of the page. Um, and then this notion of trying to use the page to sort of like create an inscape of a landscape or a relation to a landscape, a physicalized relation to a landscape. So for me, that's kind of where my poet, poetics is, is like there is something for me of, the, of my body meeting an actual place and that relationship creating a certain kind of music. 
um, but also trying to visualize it or score it on the page as well. Did that make sense? <laughs> yeah, so that's what's going on in there when I'm thinking about writing. And for me, Companion Grasses does that the most freely. Um, I feel like I really hit some sweet spots. Like I feel like after the illness, I had a harder time writing. I also had more limited mobility. So for me, syllabics had a lot to do with more limited mobility, less freedom of the body, while still trying to create some of those relationships. But even my editor, who knows my work really well, was kind of like, so what's up with the syllabics? Like, why do the lines do this? Like, because your other work, it's like so, you know, like, and I was just like, I got ill, dude. Like, I, my music changed. Like, it, I had to adapt to these constraints. Um, and that's my body. Like, it's still actually really in line with how I was thinking, but it's, I had to adapt these constraints because I can't move as freely. I can't, like, roam in the same way. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, I was, was going to say one more question, but I guess we can't, we don't have time for one more. We could just do a book signing jubilee. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sure. All right. Well, thanks so much. <laughs>